Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon and we're gonna do a follow-up to a video we did a couple days ago about Kyle Brink, a Wizards of the Coast executive producer for Dungeons and Dragons, doing a podcast interview attempting to do damage control for Wizards of the Coast and the OGL 1.1 debacle, and he actually did more damage. In fact, the backlash has been pretty severe, not just because of his comments saying that uh, white men can't leave the hobby soon enough, which could be taken a number of different ways, right? If you watch the complete context of the video, but also some of the stuff he said about the inner workings of wizards that they really just don't seem to care about the fans all that much. And the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And really this is all about just corporate posturing. I guess they were just trying to keep D and D away from uh, big tech players they claim, but they did not care about their fan base at all. D&D players, not important to them. And uh, the backlash has been so severe that Mr. Brink has gone private with his little pink unicorn plushie there. He's gone private. So uh, lots of people talking about him on Twitter. We're going to talk about it. Uh, just, you know, some of the damage control. It's kind of crazy. Polygon put out like two or three articles trying to clarify his his statements and um you know it's just not it's just not working very well it really isn't and this is you know hot on the heels of insider publishing yet another another article about how hasbro is in a very bad state right now and uh wizards really needs to get its act together so let's talk about this before we can get into it any further please subscribe for more pop culture News, views, and rants, guys. Uh, over 292, almost 293,000 subs. Thank you so much for the support. Um, we've been covering uh, tabletop gaming a lot more lately because Wizards of the Coast just keeps rolling a one, right? Uh, they had the debacle with the OGL where uh, it was leaked that they were effectively going to commandeer your fan creations if you sign the new version of the OGL and then they quasi kind of apologized for it, kind of walked it back a little bit, but the damage has been done. In fact, we mentioned in the previous video that uh, other game systems are seeing sales go through the roof. Uh, you know, some game publishers are selling eight times what they usually sell because of uh, Wizards of the Coast screwing up again and again and again. And this interview uh, on this podcast, and well, you know, no offense to the the podcasters, but it, it's not a huge channel, right? Um, but the interview actually didn't do them any favors. And at this point, I think Wizards really needs to just shut up. I think they need to just stop talking. Every time they send somebody out to do damage control, it actually causes more damage uh, to the brand for sure. So let's um, let's talk about some of the damage control here again. Kyle Brink has gone. Private. Uh, here are a couple of the articles. Um, Polygon has two or three articles here on it. Uh, again, they had to pick apart multiple things he said. They talk about racism in D and D, specifically Spelljammer and the Hadozi, which are the uh, flying space monkeys that uh, apparently are the new demon of the week. And uh, you know, some stuff he says, you know, seems to indicate to me that D and D is never going to be the same because they don't have a lot of respect for the history of the game at all. And look, there are some things that obviously they did back in the seventies and eighties. that probably wouldn't fly you know, these days, like those monkeys, the flying monkeys, but um, you know, to, to basically demonize the entire game and the players and the old school players. And we saw, we saw this, we saw this disgusting hit piece come out from PBS. I think it was PBS, a hit piece on OSR gamers that they were basically all a bunch of racists. And the only way to avoid racism in D and D was to play pure wizards of the coast brand dungeons and dragons, trademark copyright et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, I think people realize now it's just a bunch of bullshit. It really is. This was always about controlling the brand, controlling the IP, um, you know, and it does come across in that interview that fans were like the very last thing they thought about. They were concerned about, you know, like Facebook and Apple and, you know, 
Netflix and all these tech companies kind of horning in on D and D, uh, and they basically just you know stuck it to the fans, right? Uh, that that was one of my takeaways. But um, yeah, so let's look at this. This is uh, Polygon. Cultural consultants will play a bigger role in D and D, following racist content in recent book. This is not damage control. This is again. Um, this interview was catastrophic on so many levels beyond the uh, idiotic comment about, you know, white men not being able to leave fast enough. Um, so they're talking about Spelljammer. Um, they said that uh, <laughs> they've been attempting to, to walk back some of the racist uh, caricatures in D and D shortly after Spelljammer adventures in space began circulating. The Hadozi were called out for their association with in fiction slavery as well as problematic themes and images that together serve to reinforce racism against black people. Again, if you saw that in those fictitious monsters, that's on you, man. The episode prompted a formal apology from Wizards, one of many formal apologies from Wizards, a revision to to the published content and a promise to use outside cultural consultants going forward. In Monday's interview... Brink alluded to the fact that there were professional consequences for those involved. Oh, we spanked him. That was a mistake, and it was taken very seriously, and some internal actions were taken as a result. Again, because they dug up some flying monkeys from, from I think it was Star Frontiers, and they renamed them, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, because outlets like Polygon found it to be offensive and racist and the audience that they've courted, the Tumblr audience, uh, you know, they're offended by everything, right? There's a particular paragraph in there that really made the connection to past depictions that we really didn't intend to, said Brink, a senior person who was very trusted, wrote it. And very few eyes got on it before it got into the final draft. So it was two breakdowns in process. One, we were not reviewing everything. And so nobody had reviewed it. And it even... And it even got in there outside the normal process. And that is, so now their, their solution is to hire more sensitivity readers. So this is, this is what um, bothered me about that. I, I think the sensitivity reader stuff is bullshit. I really do. I mean, I, I, and I've said it before. It's like, look, you're not going to make everybody happy. I mean, as long as you're not out there deliberately uh, trying to provoke people you know, people F up or people misread your intentions or whatever, that's, you know, it happens, right? But to hire a professional sensitivity reader, they're literally looking for things to be offended about. And they're going to call attention to things. And I, I've wondered how mu- much of this outrage is actually being drummed up by sensitivity readers to make sure they're still employed, <laughs> you know, because people are getting tired of it. But this is what bothered me. d d has a long history. It's got a long and deep lore that goes back to some pretty troubling stuff. Hmm. It's got a long and deep lore that goes back to some pretty troubling stuff. Again, this sounds a lot like the satanic panic of the early 1980s that tried to, to shut down D&D and try to paint D&D and D&D players as being bad people. Just like that PBS article that tried to paint uh, OSR players as being bad. So we're in a place where we want to acknowledge and bring forward some of the cool nostalgia, but also fix the broken stuff. Fix the stuff that was wrong about it. In that space, it's very possible for somebody meaning well to make what they think is a nostalgic callback that actually dredges up with that hook a whole big wad of terrible stuff that we did not want in there in the first place. So while I can understand how the mistake was made, that does not mean the mistake was forgiven. It does not mean the mistake was not acted on. So yeah, we took it very serious. It's not something that can happen again with the current structure. It can't happen again because we're going to hire more sensitivity readers. Okay, good luck with that. Good luck with that. I mean, what is it going to take for more people to just ditch this game? Like, they are neutering the hell out of this game. They're chasing their players off. They're calling their players racist. They're telling you if you're a white dude, you can't get gone fast enough. And now they're like, we're going to even double, triple down on it. This is not damage control. This is ridiculous. Uh, here's a whole nother article. Uh, D&D exec, OGL fiasco worsened by lack of respect for Wizards of the Coast. Um, they said that there needed to be 
there needed to be uh, more of a, a, a relationship between Wizards and Hasbro. I was trying to protect the team from distractions, said Brink, like discussing a licensing agreement so we can make the game, so we can make cool supplements and books. And I should have had more of my team in the room. And that's been corrected going forward about the OGL, right? Um, <laughs> so they had to... They had to release this uh, unsigned statement, right? Following o- IO9's initial leak of a draft of the proposed OGL changes on January 5th, neither Wizards nor Hasbro provided an immediate response. Now, they went radio silent for like a week. When one was delivered on January 13th, many saw it as a petulant half measure and little more. The unsigned statement delivered on D&D Beyond read in part as follows. Couple of last thoughts. First, we won't be able to release the OGL today because we need to make sure we get it right, but it's coming. Second, you're going to hear people say that they won and we lost because making your voices heard forced us to change our plans. Those people will only be half right. They won and so did we. Everybody's a winner. We're all winners, according to the sensitivity readers. <laughs> I honestly don't know who contributed to that unsigned statement before I started posting. Wow, that's interesting. So nobody knows who wrote that the statement that came out. I read it around the same time that you did. Wow. So nobody knows what the hell is actually going on over there. Just more sensitivity readers. A second statement, this time a far more full throated apology was made on January 19th and signed by Brink. I was not pleased with what we had posted. This is one of those things that inspired me to take it personal and put myself into this by name and take ownership of this because I, that was not acceptable. That's not us. That's not who we should be. And I feel like this needs to be less of a committee thing and more of a D&D thing. The committee that Brink's referring to is described throughout the interview as a collection of management, executives, and the legal counsel tasked with refining the next version of the OGL. Lots of, lots of suits. Lots of suits involved in this. According to Brink, there were dissenting opinions in the room and they came from the team at Wizards. Unfortunately, their protests were not taken enough into account by the larger group. So they're trying to say, Wizards, Wizards are the good guys. It's just mean old Hasbro. Mean old Hasbro just went ahead with it and they just did what they were going to do, guys. I would say the voices of our creative and our community teams wasn't loud enough in the room and that's what's changing. We're giving more of a voice to the folks on my team, myself included, who are closer to the community and will be able to catch this kind of thing in the future and have enough volume to prevent it. Yeah, bullshit. Because if if you listen to more of that interview, they basically said that uh, what they were concerned about mostly was keeping D&D away from like Facebook and stuff. Um, and bellofloftsouls.net has, has a breakdown of it too. Uh, they said that, yeah, they were concerned about mega corporations like Meta or Disney as they took D&D digital. They didn't care about the fans. They really didn't. As many in the community pointed out, if that was truly the case, why not set the royalty limit higher? Yeah, if it was like Meta or Disney, it'd be like, okay, you make more than a couple million, a couple million dollars or $5 million, then we got a problem. A huge part of the recent community uproar has been the impact the changes had on smaller creators. This is all bullshit. This is all damage control. This is bullshit. This is a lie. This is absolutely positively a lie. And Kyle Brink went out there. I don't know how involved in these decisions he was, but he went out there and he was going to be the sacrificial goat, right? They were going to send him out there, but he's even saying like, I don't even know what the hell's going on. Hasbro just kind of put that statement out. Now the guy's gone private. Like that, that interview did not do you any favors. Wizards of the coast. Holy hell. Brink admits the, that Watsi had gone about it the wrong way and expressed that Watsi was grateful for the community helping them to see that. Uh, it's up to you as to whether or not you believe that seeing a billion-dollar company actively losing monthly income was merely a coincidence with the change that was already planning to happen or if, in fact, the material loss is indeed the biggest lever that helped convince the billion-dollar company to pump the brakes on its awful plan. Yeah, they saw the subs drop off on D&D Beyond. Speaking of D&D Beyond... I have heard from a couple of people. Now, I'm not a member of D&D Beyond currently, but I have heard from a couple of people that you are not even allowed to discuss the Kyle Brink situation over there. If somebody could clarify and, you know, if you want to reach out and be like, yeah, that that actually is the case. Um, and just kind of, you know, give me some uh, cooperation. That would be fantastic. But I am hearing that you're not allowed to discuss it, that they will actually ban you if you discuss it. Uh, so yeah, Kyle Brink not not uh, being associated with a lot of uh, 
nice things being said currently in uh, RPG Twitter, uh, you know, for a number of reasons. And um, God, good luck with it. Good luck with all of this. Again, you know, multiple articles being put out there about the trouble that Wizards of the Coast is in, that Hasbro's in. Hasbro just laid off 15% of their staff. Uh, I'm hearing they even cut people from like the G.I. Joe classified team. And it's, it's getting pretty real over there, guys. And there are lots of concerns about their quality control. They're charging more money for Transformers. And because of the, the uh, way the packaging is, you can't see if your toys are damaged or if the paint job sucks, if they're missing parts. Uh, lots of complaints. Uh, people complaining about, again, in the Transformer space, it's just all repaints at this point and that the stuff is cheap. And uh, the D&D toys that are coming out, people are making fun of them, the freaking dragon crossbow and all this other crazy stuff coming out. People just don't care. So Hasbro had better figure out what it is. Are you a video game company, Hasbro? Are you a, a movie studio? That's not working out very well, and I do not think the D&D movie is going to do that well. Or are you a toy company, a game company? That's what you're supposed to be. That's what you're supposed to be is a toy and game manufacturer, but that is apparently not good enough for you uh, after the death of Brian Goldner. So good luck with all of this. A lot of people are moving on. I think the damage is done and this attempt at damage control is not working out very well. I'm going to wrap it up. Please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants, and we'll talk later.